Hi friends, my name is Kendra Winchester and I, I am very tired. <laughs> As you could tell, I'm in my very casual Zelda Ocarina of Time tea. Uh, I am just, I am here, I am existing. <laughs> We're gonna do a wrap up today. I've already done some things over on TikTok, so if you want the most updated, full view of my reading life, head over there. It's been really nice to have very short form, accessible content as far as creation goes for me, as since I have so few spoons, so would definitely check that out if you want to learn more. Today we're going to be doing some highlights, some brief snippets of my thoughts on them. I'm going to be reviewing the majority of this books, these books for like Audiophile Magazine or Book Riot. All of these books are ones most of them have been assigned to me or that I asked to be assigned. <laughs> um, so for my short story a day challenge, um, I'm still in the middle of one for it and I will have finished it in April, so I'll cover it on that end. But the last one I guess that I have is Mouthful of Birds by Samantha Schweblin. There are a lot of stories in this tiny short story collection. Um, I was kind of surprised. This is translated from Spanish by Megan McDowell. Um, it's phenomenal. I will be reading all of Samantha Schweblin's translated books 100, 100%. They are all gonna be done this year. I love her. I, I love her. So I feel like this is great if you love like Mariana Enriquez, who also has a short story collection coming out in the fall. I just saw the cover. It's amazing. I digress. Loved it. Well, we, I'll be doing a challenge quarterly check-in at some point here in the near future. Uh, another book in translation that I read is Sasashi Kashiwai's The Kamagawa Food Detectives, translated by Jesse Kirkwood. Um, this is like, this is sort of like, um, before the coffee gets cold, that uh, series where people can travel back in time, but they have to sit in the chair and they have to finish their conversation before the coffee gets cold and all that, right? This is in the same vein. So some people describe it as cozy, which, okay, yeah, sure, there's lots of nostalgia and coziness, but ultimately it really is looking at some big questions about memories made into our childhood and how important those are to us, all sorts of things. It's very episodic. Each chapter is a new meal and uh, a, uh, father-daughter team runs this like restaurant and a uh, side street and they take cases where people want to find meals from their past and so the dad researches the ingredients and where the thing was made and like all of this stuff and the daughter interviews the people and it's really interesting it's really enjoyable but it it's I will it's not really cozy. <laughs> it has a lot of heft. It makes you very sad. It has that sad nostalgia vibes 100%. I don't know what Dylan is doing. Who knows? Does anyone know? No. Uh, the corgis do their own thing, as you may have gathered as Gwenlyon is hiding underneath this chair. Anyway, all right. Um, ours by Philip B. Williams. I loved this. Janice Abbott Pratt performs the audiobook, and that is phenomenal. I will read anything that woman performs. Stunning. Um, this has like black surrealism, so you think like the fantastical elements of like Jasmine Ward or Toni Morrison, that sort of situation. We have that vibe going with this book. So we have a woman named Saint who is moving across Arkansas and freeing enslaved black people off these plantations. They go and she creates a town called Ours for them, um, but she ends up being very controlling. And so we meet this host of characters, so many characters um, that really play into Saint, who she is, where she came from. Saint appears with twins. Where did she get these twins? The twins seem to also have some sort of fantastical powers like she does. What is going on with all of that? Um, I did not expect to be swept away by this novel. Like I thought I would enjoy it, but I found myself completely engrossed in whatever was going on. And we jump around a lot in time. We jump around between characters' viewpoints. We never know really what exactly is going on. And I loved every second of it. It was just, it was just phenomenal. I think it might be one of my favorite audiobooks of the year. It's close. Um, it's so good. So those are some fiction books. I also read Funny Story by Emily Henry, which is performed by Julie Whalen, if you're listening to the audiobook. And that was fun. It's about a woman um, whose fiance leaves her for his childhood best friend, 
but her ex-fiance's childhood's best friend's boyfriend is also devastated. So our protagonist and the boyfriend of the now girlfriend, anyway, they end up living together. Sparks fly. It's Emily Henry, you're gonna have a good time. Um, the other one is James by Russell Everett. There have been some really great like literary reviews of this book, so I don't feel like I need to delve deeply into how much I enjoyed this book, um, but it is uh, phenomenally performed by Dominique Hoffman on audio, um, and so I reviewed it for Audiophile. I will put the link in the show notes, and it I just, I really enjoyed it. I loved how Percival Everett like flipped the character of Jim and Huckleberry Finn on its head. He did this whole reimagining. Um, definitely worth your time if you have been wondering whether or not you want to pick it up. Okay, so last section of this is going to be nonfiction. Um, so we have Morgan Parker, um, who is a disabled a uh, black woman who writes about being single, about racial justice, around mental health and disability, um, all sorts of different topics. And that's what this essay collection delves into. I love Morgan Parker. Uh, and the way that she's able to look at the world is so fascinating to me. And I love her essays. I love how she just jumps into different things. And her I, don't, I always want to know what she has to say, and I think that really marks for me a great essayist and her understanding of intersectionality and living in America as a black disabled woman. What does that look like? Um, and she has this excellent essay on singleness that I haven't really seen too many essays being published on that. Um, of late. I feel like for a while there in my 20s, there was all sorts of essays on singleness, but now I haven't seen as many. Maybe I'm just off the internet more, but um, if you know of any, please send them to me. But yeah, that's Morgan Parker. Would recommend. Um, Grief um, is for People by Sloan Crosley. And this is actually my first book of Sloan Crosley, Crosley that I've read, but I'm really interested in the topic of grief. I'm working on something and, and always want to know, you know, what people think uh, about grief. And this is, it, to me, this felt like a very long essay. So this is sort of like, not a full, it's like whatever a novella for essays would be, right? Like if an essay is equivalent to a short story, this would be equivalent to a novella. This is about her dealing with the loss of her best friend who died by suicide and what that was like for her. Um, I would recommend this if you're looking in on grief. Um, if you're just casually interested, you could check it out, but it, it does read like a long essay as opposed to a full length memoir or book. It's really just an expanded form of that. And I can feel like people who really love stuff like that will love this, but if you're just casually picking up something, it might not be your vibe. You know, it just all depends. I read Splinters by Leslie Jameson. If you've been here for, for any length of time, I feel like you, you may remember, I have a very one-sided, tumultuous relationship with Leslie Jameson because the woman is extremely talented, but she has a lot of privilege that she doesn't seem to know how to acknowledge in her writing. And that frustrates me um, because the way that she thinks through things is directly impacted by the privilege that she has as she moves about through the world. And that's not to say she doesn't go through hard things. Of course she does. But there are moments where I'm just like, ah, oh, I feel like you missed the mark on that. But there's, as her work has progressed, she has become more and more aware of her place in the world and the privilege that she holds. And so every book progressively, I feel like has become more self-aware, which, you know, she thanks therapy in this book and different things, I would agree. Of all her books so far that I have read, this doesn't feel as cohesive as some of her other books but I'm interested to see what other people think who've also read her books. So if you've read her other books, let me know. I haven't read Make It Scream, Make It Burn, I think is what it's called, her essay collection. I haven't read that yet, but uh, let me know what you think of this. So talented. Um, so I also read Ned Blackhawk's The Discovery of America, Native Peoples, and the Unmaking of U.S. History. Uh, Dr. Ned Blackhawk won the National Book Award for this, and this really delves into the history of Turtle Island from the perspective of Native peoples and like key moments, as opposed to, you know, here in the U.S., we're taught U.S. history through the lens of progressive colonization from the perspective of the colonizers, and this is the reverse of that, of 
progressive events from the perspective of Native peoples. And this isn't meant to be your only book that you read on the history of Native peoples, but it is a great starting place. And I feel like with the end notes and everything, there is so much here um, to really start your experience. If you, you know, you're at the beginning of learning about Native peoples and the history, you could start here and there's so many resources you could continue. And when I'm recommending books about, you know, Native history as a, you know, of Native peoples, I find myself recommending this one now already. So I've already recommended it to several people. It's very heavy. I'm going to put it down now. Um, but there's, um, it's very good. There, there's obviously a reason it won the National Book Award. Uh, I found myself engrossed in this book and uh, I cannot, I cannot recommend it enough. Last, uh, a book I don't want to talk about. Okay, so this is Scars of Colors Alive by Mary V. v. Dearborn. And this is about Carson McCullers, who is a Southern Gothic writer who wrote The Heart is Lonely Hunter, uh, Members of Wedding. Um, some of her work was made into successful Broadway plays. Um, and so Mary V. Deborn really looks at the complex figure that is Carson McCullers. She was a prodigy, but she also was an alcoholic and grew up in a house of alcoholics. She had a very toxic... Um, relationship with her husband who she divorced and then remarried they were really on again off again they didn't have an open marriage but they both kind of lived like they have an open marriage at least that's what how mary v dearborn presents them and that's the thing that i really struggle with mary v dearborn um as you may have gathered by my hedging mary v dearborn does a lot of well this could have been interpreted as that and if that is true then this might also be true there's a lot of could be mites and ifs and there was a lot of speculation that really wasn't backed up 100 percent by what she was quoting because it some she'll quote a passage and it could be taken five different ways but she chooses one of them and then makes like progressive assumptions based on that first assumption and it's very confusing and i was like a little bit of speculation is fine and sometimes she'll be like it could have been taken as a b or c but we don't know and i appreciated that her saying we don't know um but that's not always the case so i found that a bit frustrating but i think the most frustrating thing was is that reading this i could tell she hadn't really done research into disability studies carson mccullers had strokes um and so she had some long-term effects of these strokes. And at the time that Carson McCullers lived, you know, um, hysteria was, was a diagnosis. And there were certain diagnoses that were commonly given to women who had physical problems, but they were told they were all in their head or they're psychosomatic or whatever. I feel like the huge part of her analysis is flawed because she doesn't have that study in disability studies that she's missing these key points that of course Carson McCullers is going to have long-term effects she's had strokes from a very early point in her life like she's been chronically ill for most of her life and I feel like that is a huge part of who Carson McCullers is that just isn't handled very well by this book and while there's so much great info in this book uh, and I really enjoyed learning more about Carson McCullers. This just huge piece of the pie is just eviscerated. I'm mixing my metaphors. I've sat here and I thought a like devil's advocate of like why Mary V. Dubron might have written this way, might have written that way, how other people might view her perspective of featuring Carson McCullers as a chronically ill person. Um, but ultimately, I found it frustrating as a chronically ill person who's received the same language and dialogue, the same ableism, and you're not going to mention the ableism, if you're not going to even go in to acknowledge that that is an issue, then I don't feel like your portrait of Carson McCullers is going to be complete. I guess that would be a good summary. Um, so I was very disappointed by the book because I was so excited for it because I love Carson McCullers and she was a complex figure which Dearborn captures in that sense. But as far as chronic illness goes and disability, it was just a huge miss for me. Anyway, those are the books that I read in March. Those are my highlights. Uh, what did you read in March? And I'll see you in the next one. Bye, friends.